do in the tab theory that Voivodsky is using equality uh, A equals B makes sense only among objects of the same type. Uh, more precisely, the syntax allows to write it only when A and B have been declared as being object of the same type and is um, not as usual to be thought as a proposition, but itself is a type. Now this uh, intrigued me, especially since I have always been very interested in using transport of structure, which is somewhat at the basis of the univalence axiom. And so I want to understand what do we usually mean by equal and how it's related to this uh, formalism. Now, it's soon clear that we use the word equal with different meanings. And that's perfectly all right, as Humpty Dumpty was saying to Alice, I would say that when you make a word work hard, we pay him extra. We just should know at each time in which sense we are using the word. So, if first I use the Hamel of Frankel set theory, then everything is a set, and by axiom, you have that x equals y means that both have the same element. No, that's all hard. It's not the usual way we have of using the sign equal, but again, there is no harm in that because uh, for me, the Hermel of Hangul is not, or any formal system is not a tool for writing mathematics. It's the tool for analyzing proof and also a uh, very useful thing, it gives a common meaning to what it means to have a proof. If somebody means I have a proof of something, for me it means that in principle it can be formalized in the Hermel of Frankel set theory. So at least we, I know what is meant. And this has not always been the case. In the 18th century, with, uh, where people looking at analysis, it was not all, all clear what a proof was meaning. Uh, so that's one meaning of the proof, but as I was telling, it's not the usual meaning, and it was not the usual meaning both before or after uh, the Hermel of Hankel set theory. If I go a few thousand years uh, before the Hermel of Hankel, when we say in Euclidean, ge Euclidean plane geometry that two triangles are equal, we don't mean that they are the same triangle. <coughs> what we mean, in fact, was not completely clear. Um, it more or less means that we can move one to another by an isometry and everything we care about will not change. In modern terms, we would say that there is an automorphism of the plane mapping one triangle to the other, but this is completely anachronistic because first moving the whole plane or space would not have been seen as very physically possible where it's possible to move a piece of paper with a triangle onto another one. And also the concept of the whole space was not uh, well considered because of some taboo on actual infinity. But so we have this from long time ago. And if I take more recent example, when you, we had something like par n of Sn equals z, 
or if we had the Cunet formula for, co for homology with coefficient in a field, we surely don't mean that they are equal in the sense of their Molo-Frankel. They are had a different kind of objects. Um, so, in those cases, somewhat as for the triangle, we mean the weak sense is that there exists some isomorphism between both. Um, but now, in all of those cases, existence of isomorphism is a weak statement and as a rule we mean more. So for instance if I look at again a triangle in plane geometry if I look at some triangles one has those criterion of equality of triangle that if one has the same angle and the same length of the two sides, then the two triangles are equal. This is a weak statement. You don't just want to know that there is an isometry between the triangles. You want to know that this isometry will carry this point to this point, this point to this point, and this point to this point. And this is a stronger statement. For instance, if you look at some uh, triangle with one angle and two equal sides, you can use the criterion of equality of triangle to write ABC equals ECB. And so you will note that the, the criterion tells you there is an isometry mapping A to A, B to C, and C to A. So you get the symmetry property from the equality criterion that the angle B and C are equal. So uh, that's one aspect that you want to, you care what isomorphism between, you have between objects because you also care about symmetries of objects. And, and uh, there, uh, I said those are weak statements uh, because it's in practice useless to just know existence of some isomorphism. Here you would like to know, for instance, that the identity map of SN corresponds to one in Z, if you want to apply the statement, and here you want to know that you have some very explicit isomorphism mapping homologic, homologic classes alpha and beta to uh, some product of the inverse image of alpha and beta by the two factors. So the what I want to remember of this is that very often equality means existence of isomorphism, but that we also care to understanding the isomorphism between those objects, not just their existence. And this corresponds quite well to what you have here. First, to speak of isomorphism of object they have, to have the same kind of object. So that's the condition that equality between A and B is meaningful only if you have object of the same type. And the fact that in this case, for Porto's example, equality is a type, here it would be interpreted as it is the set of isomorphism between A and B. And uh, often you will not just prove equality, but you will exhibit 
some object of type equality. So this double dot means is of type, meaning you construct an isomorphism and you will use it uh, later, the one we have constructed. Um, Now, one thing which is already appearing in this formalism, so you, you have this story, you start with uh, some type A, you have two objects of type A, you can consider the type equality of A and B, and I would say that in it, uh, so, sorry, and if you consider A equals A, in it you have the identity, isomorphism of identity between A and A. Um, and there are a number of, so you, this tells you that you could iterate the process. You can, in this formal, you can consider two object of types A, uh, equals B, consider the type of equality between those objects and uh, iterate. And this occurs in various ga guise quite often. You have the story of homotopy theory where equality of X and Y correspond to homotopy equivalence between X and Y. If you have two homotopy equivalence, you can consider homotopies between homotopies. If you have two homotopies between homotopies, you can consider homotopies between some and so on. So there you can go further and further. And there, so that's one context, but there are other contexts where you have the same story. Uh, if you consider categories, C and D, equality essentially corresponds to having an equivalence of categories between them. Now, if you have two equivalents of categories, you can wonder about isomorphism between those equivalents, and here the story stops there, but for higher categories, it would continue for a while. Uh, also, another example, if you consider a complex, and you consider homology classes, cohomology classes of this complex, often you want to, to consider cosacle, and now an equality between cosacle would be uh, a cotrain of one previous dimension, yes, and the foot that we call it like a, so that dA is C minus C prime, so something showing that the two have the same cohomology class. And now you can continue. If you have two such A's, the difference is a cosacle, and you may want it to be a co-boundary and so on. So this is another setting when you go, uh, you can iterate this notion of equality, and it's often very useful to keep track of it. For instance, if I look at some kind of cohomology, if you have cohomology class H and H prime and proof that they are equal, more precisely, if you prove in two different ways that they are equal, often it will, from this you get a cohomology class in one lower dimension. The idea being that you look at cosacle C and C prime corresponding to your cohomology class. One proof of equality of the cohomology class will give you that the difference of the cosacle is D of something. The other proof of equality of the cohomology class will give that it is D of something else, and now you have A minus IA prime, the difference between the two proofs, which is a cohomology class in H and minus one. 
So I can give one not very important example. Uh, consider cohomology of a space with coefficient z mod 2. Now, you know that if you have two cohomology class, the co-product in cohomology mod 2 will be commutative. And it's true only because of uh, z mod 2, otherwise you would have a minus sign. Now, if you consider a class cup itself, this gives you two proofs that um, alpha cup alpha is equal to cup to alpha cup alpha. First, the obvious proof is the same thing. And then this proof of commutativity. And so uh, from your class alpha you started with, not only you get a cup product in S2n, but the fact that you have two proof of equality of alpha cup alpha with itself give, will give you a commodity class in H2n minus 1, which is some uh, Steenrod square uh, of alpha. So it's, it's useful to keep track of those equality between equalities between equalities in a number of different contexts. Now, there is one thing we care about equality, and it's the reason we use the same word to describe different situations. If you have some equality A equals B, you care that everything you do on A, you can do on B in the same way. That um, transport of structure or uh, not having to care which one you use, or you will univalence axiom. Uh, and the usual way of uh, handling this is um, restricting the language which we is allowed to use, like for instance in thermal of Frankel theory. Let me give an example. Suppose you have two groups and you have an isomorphism between them. Then everything you do on G uh, is, is true the same way on G prime, except if you use the full language of the Hamel of Frankel, this is clearly false. You can wonder, for instance, if this uh, particular set an element of G, and you can have an isomorphism between two groups, and this is a wrong question, so it will not be equivalent for G and G prime. So um, you should know when it's okay to use a transport of structure and tell that anything on G can be transported to G prime. And in chapter four of, oh yes, first I should tell a little more about restricting the language one allow oneself to use. This is something which is very familiar. For instance, consider the notion of integers, uh, 0, 1, 2, and so on. There are a number of different definitions. If you like uh, the definition of Rig, you have the empty set, the set reduced to the empty set, and so on, and in general, n plus 1 is equal to the set of integer smaller or equal to n. So that's one definition. If you lack a Russell definition, you will tell that it's a class of uh, all sets with the same cardinality as some finite set. And a, vari a variant of it is the one used by Bourbaki. <coughs> you, was, you would use a universal... 
Frag which one? The, the second one is Frege 2? Oh. Uh -huh. uh, well, I was thinking this one was, sorry, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then in Bourbaki, there is a universal choice axiom into formalism, selecting an element in every class. And then in Bourbaki, integer is a representative of such a class of equipotent finite sets. Now, when you write an article and you use integers, you don't tell which one of the definition you will be using, but this means that you will not allow yourself to use anything where this definition would be relevant. For instance, if you are an homotopy theorist and you want to consider the set 0 to n, you will call it maybe delta n, you will not call it n plus 1. So um, restricting the language one uses is something quite familiar. We do all the time. And similarly, to tell when one can use transport of structure, uh, Bourbaki made a valiant effort to codify what or one has to restrict the language one was using. But I find it a little ironic that the formalism he was giving was adequate until about the time where this chapter was published only. So um, one important thing always is first you I will describe a little what he was doing. And first, one has to tell what is a structure on some sets. So you have some sets A1, AL, and you want to define what is a structure of some kind on this set. Now, I simplify a little. Bourbaki was also using some auxiliary set like uh, the integers or some ground field which you would be using. So, so the first thing one has to tell is where, what kind of object the structure is. And this is telling that it belongs to some set built from the basic set by some a list of operations, so which one can tell the type of object S is. But the, const the construction which Bourbaki is using are very few. There was just product and set of all uh, subsets. So for instance, if you, uh, yes, and so, for instance, if I want to tell what the group is, I will first tell that I that the structure is an element of the set of subset of E times E times E, which I have to think as a graph of a map of the composition law from E times E going to E. Uh, now, when I have tell what the type of the structure is, one thing I get is that if I have a big bijection, between F1, F, E, L, my basic set. Let me just think to one basic set. Here's another example. If you want the structure of a topological space, your S will be in P of P of E, the set of all open subsets for the topology. Now, if you have a bijection from your basic set to another set, and you have some S of which you have prescribed the type, this will allow you to go from a structure on S on E to a structure on F. You can, if you have a subset of E, it gives you a subset of F. If you have a set of subsets, it gives you a set of subsets. But first, for that, you have, of course, to prescribe 
what type of object you are considering. And now the axioms of the structure should be such that the axiom are true for some S if and only if they are true for some transported S. And there is a lot of criterion to know when this holds true. And in practice, we do this with our thinking. We don't put stupid axioms like phi in, is an element of our basic set or something like that, which would not be transportable. Um, now, one basic thing one has here, if you want to make st statements which are uh, transportable, one important thing is that you can require equality only between objects of the same type. And this corresponds to also this condition that you should never have an equality between objects of different type. This, here it would not be transportable. Um, now, I was telling that this was adequate on almost up to when the Bourbaki book was published, and essentially for two reasons. One is that the type construction allows are much too restrictive in practice. For instance, if you look at some topological space X, which you take fixed and consider sheaves on F, so part of the data or pre-sheaf, what you want, for each open set, you want some set F of U. And you know what isomorphism of sheaves is supposed to do on, on X. Sorry, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, if you have S in F of U and T in F of V, it, would, it should make no sense to require equality between S and T because this if you have an isomorphism of this sheaf is another one, this kind of condition will not be respected. So this is a, a basic example where this formalism is insufficient. Yes, I would say that when you are in this setting, the notion of isomorphism follows is automatic. You don't have to define what isomorphism is. It's just... Um, Isomorphism of, if you have S and T, uh, a bit direction from E to F will be an isomorphism of S and T if it maps F, S to T. Um, so these are uh, an example of when things are outside of this formalism. And also some construction we like to do uh, are not allowed in the formalism in the sense that we don't want to prescribe a type or it would be artificial. For instance, if you have over a field two vector space and you want to consider their tensor product, the only thing you care is that you have a map from V tensor W to the tensor product with some universal property. Now you might uh, construct the object first by telling that you take the free group generated by pairs of elements and you would get something of some type over the basic set, but that's rather artificial and that's all Bourbaki does to define tensor product. But, um, you just care about universal property, which defines V tensor W up to unique isomorphism. And this is also outside of the formalism which Bourbaki uses. Um,
Yes, and one thing I wonder if that, uh, if this was at that time not also a psychological barrier to the notion of uh, analytic space <coughs> with nilpotent or scheme with nilpotent. Because if you want to consider just complex reduced analytic space, the structure which is enough to give if when is a function from x to c analytic. So the structure is some set of functions it has to satisfy a number of axioms and this was fitting with the formalism. But if you have an important, you have to give some sheaf with some property and this falls outside of the formalism which was used. But in practice, we know, we have enough experience to know what we can tell and what we should not tell, so that whatever we do in one situation can be transported to a nasomorphic situation. Even if there is no actual reference in the literature for justifying, justifying it in all cases when we want to do it. Now, if we go to categories instead of set with structure, then the situation is not as good. So, suppose we have two categories. If you have an equivalence of categories between them, and if you, are, you think in a categorical frame of mind, everything you do on C, you should, should be able to be transported to D. And we somewhat know uh, when things we tell can be indeed transported, but we don't always respect those rules or we are sloppy. For instance, if we have some functor, yes, one thing, uh, one basic rule which is not always respected, it's almost always bad to write equality between objects. Existence of an isomorphism, of giving an isomorphism, that's good, but equality between objects is dangerous. So for instance, if you have a functor between categories and you want to define the fiber of C to D at an object of D, it's a very bad idea to tell that you look at uh, the X so that Fx equals D. At least it's a bad idea except if this functor has some nice property like being a vibration. The, the notion which is good is to consider an object of x together with an isomorphism of fx with d. This definition is not compatible by replacing c and d by something equivalent, and this is compatible. At least if you replace c and d by equivalent things, uh, you will get an equivalent uh, end result. And it's quite important that the statement one makes are uh, invariant by equivalence, the same way that it's important when we speak of integers, we, make, we don't use a specific definition, but something which works equally well for all of them. Because even for very standard categories, there are small variant of the definition which give different categories and it would be a mess if you have to tell which exact definition you are using. Um, so we somewhat know what we should do for categories, but here something new happens is that in the case of structure, uh, essentially, if we are a little 
we apply some advenic rules, we know that the transport of structure will work well. For categories, there are cases where uh, the construction gives is, inv is invariant by this kind of equivalence, but, but where it's not completely obvious on the face of it. So let me give some examples. If you have such categories, you can consider the nerve of C, the nerve of D, and you will get a map of spaces from one to the other, and this will be a homotopy equivalence. It's not difficult, but it's not completely obvious on the face of it. For instance, if you take here just one object and one automorphism, and here you take a few objects with just one isomorphism between two of them, here you will get something like a point, and here you get something contractible, but still you might have to prove it. It's not a difficult proof, but still, uh, in difference to the case of structure, it's not a tautology. And another more useful example, well, more, suppose you have some abelian category A, and you want to define the sorry, the higher KTRA group of A, or better, you want to define the KTRA spectrum of A. So, somewhat the intuition of what you want to do is somewhat clear. Uh, you, here in this category, you have objects, you want each object to define a virtue. Yes, if, if I think to this as an infinity category groupoid of which I take the pi i, I want to each object to attach a virtual object. I want a thought exact, yes, a, a thought exact sequence should give me something and it would be universal in some way. So that's some intuition, but which I don't think one has formalized. And then there are a number of definitions which I guess always rely on the same intuition, the Q, from Q construction of Quillen or the Walt Rosen construction of K theory groups. But uh, and in all cases, it's true that if you have an equivalence of abelian categories, you will get the same uh, gay groups. But it requires a proof which is not difficult, but which is not completely obvious. Um, And I would say that the situation gets somewhat worse if you are going to higher categories and wondering what definition you want to make exactly. Now, here I would begin by telling that I have only a partial understanding of what I am telling, but my take of the univalence axiom is that one wants to have a language which one has a notion of equality which incorporates all those uh, difficulties and where it is impossible to state things which would contradict transport of structure. Um, I must say I get somewhat worried that it reminds me very much of the novel of 1984 of Orwell, 
where the ideal was to have a language where it was impossible to express heretical, to heretical <laughs> thoughts. Um, the reason I find it worrying is that there are those examples, like definition of K theory groups, nerve of a category, where the thought is not heretical, but it's not so obvious it's not heretical. And so the language we want to do would make it easy and not difficult to tell of those things. Um, and now this is more something where I would like to be um, explain things, but I have wondered for a while and Grayson had to reassure me with the, the axioms used are strong enough for the intended purpose, but maybe I am misunderstanding the intended purpose sometime. So, of course, I am willing to believe that you can reconstruct the Hamel of Frank, Frank or model the Hamel of Frankel inside this type theory, so that in such sense it's strong enough. But it's also not the point. If you have to use this beautiful trial to understand what equals mean and then throw it away to do what you want to do, that's not the point. Uh, and then uh, I have some concrete question where I wonder if how expressible it is and how much one can prove things which would be obvious or whether some axiom may, may be missing. So I want to give one example of what I have in mind and maybe one I will be told that it's all easy. So suppose you have some type and some element of that type. So the intended picture for me is that this is a topological space representing some homotopy type and here I have a point of that space. Then in that case the type A equals A corresponds to the loop space of A based at this point and in it you have the identity which is of that type. So you see you start from a type with something of that type and you get again a type with something of that type and it should correspond to the loop space construction and clearly you can iterate this. So you iterate a number of type, times and you define at a n, which is an object of uh, some type uh, corresponding to some in some iterated loop space. Now, suppose that you know, for instance, in the Hamel of Frankel theory, that in pi m plus k of Sn, you have some element, and even possibly that you have it realized at some explicit map from Sn plus k to Sn. So the question is, from this, can you in the type theory, recover, construct something of type identity A. Uh, so, I, so I guess I should say maybe A equals N A. So the, the loop space from something from A equals N A to A equals n plus k a. Corresponding to the picture that if you have an element of pi n plus k as n, this gives you a map from the n full loop space to the n plus k full loop space. So the question, can this be done? And also one would like this to have some universal property, at least that if you have two elements which are distinct, there would be instances where uh, uh, the map, the equality between the map you get um, being equal lead to contradiction. 
Um, sorry? Uh, oh yes, thank you. Uh, no, no, uh, no. If you have, you go from the, you go from, you have pi n plus k of S n, so a map of S n plus k to S n, so you want something from the n iterated loop space to the n plus k iterated loop space. And I must say that for me, this is related to some dream which I have also. In Lurie's formalist for higher categories, a thing like this is somewhat put inside the formalism that uh, uh, he used a formalism of spaces or simplicial spaces and then this has to come from free, but I still wonder whether one could give or has been given some definition of higher categories so that statement of this kind can be used to define a uh, homotopy group of sphere, or possibly compute sometime. In some easy case, for instance, if you look at part three of uh, S2, this can be done by hand, um, but in general I have no idea and I will stop there.